you mean the rebellion of 1857-58? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the ones who rebelled were either killed or captured. And if they were captured, they were most likely killed. Uh, but of course, once the rebellion ended in 1858, uh, then at that point, uh, the Indian Army, that is the Army of the East India Company, was actually completely restructured. It was completely restructured. It's a very long story. Uh, but essentially, what the British did was they, they decided that they would actually reorganize the Indian Army uh, according to a very simple principle. The principle is simple at one level and completely obscure at another level, namely that they divided all Indians into two categories of people, martial races and non-martial races. Right? So martial races were those who were deemed to be people who had a kind of a warrior spirit within them. And so what's going to happen is that the composition of the army is going to change. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why the Sikhs, uh, you can recognize Sikhs uh, by the fact that they're turban, that is the ones who actually observe the rituals of the faith. Uh, not everyone who wears a turban in India is a Sikh, though, because there are Muslims and Hindus who might be turbaned as well. Uh, but the Sikhs are basically people from the Punjab, which is a state in Western India. Um, and uh, the British view was that the Sikhs are a, a martial race, that they have a military-like spirit about them. So one of the consequences of this policy was that the proportion of Sikhs in the Indian <coughs> Army went up dramatically. They only constitute about 2.5% of the population of India, but at one point, they constituted 30% uh, of the Indian Army, you know, roughly. All right, so that's that's the basic story that the sepoys were, as I said, you know, killed, and then uh, the ones who were captured uh, at, uh, after 1858, they were, uh, you know, some of them were obviously sentenced to terms and so on. But essentially, the Indian Army was restructured. You know, uh, any further questions that anybody has uh, about anything we've covered thus far? All right, so. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to see if this uh, comes on. If it doesn't, that's fine, because uh, uh, I can certainly talk without a PowerPoint. Uh, now, uh, we, we'll see what happens here. But in the meantime, uh, what I want to do is I want to go back to the question of indentured labor. So what I want to do today, of course, is to, is to continue my narrative of migration, uh, the whole question of global migration. Uh, indentured labor was one segment of that. Uh, or obviously, the immigration to the United States uh, is another significant segment of that that we want to look at, and very briefly at Brazil. And then in the second half of the lecture, I'm going to look at uh, the subject of uh, technology, uh, a very large subject. And when I say technology, I mean actually a great many things by it, uh, not just simply what is ordinarily understood to be uh, technology. Well, uh, it looks like we're without luck here. Uh, I, I had some interesting. Uh, slides, but uh, the system doesn't seem to want to cooperate. Let's give it one last shot here and see if it works. Uh, and if it doesn't, we just have to do without it. You know, uh, just give me a second here.
So, so this is where we were. We were on the question of uh, in-game indenture labor. Uh, now, uh, I just want to add a, a few more details to that. So, you know, uh, the, the first thing to keep in mind is that uh, you remember the article by McEwen, uh, which is on global migration, and one of the things that he points out is that uh, the, if you look at the literature, there is a tendency to think that the, uh, that the migrations to the Atlantic, uh, that is to the United States uh, in particular, were largely uh, of people that you might describe as free labor. Uh, this is, of course, after the abolition of slavery. And, and, and I don't think we can speak incidentally of Africans who were brought uh, to the United States as migrants. Uh, they were not migrants. Uh, they were brought here as slaves. Uh, there's a significant difference here. Uh, but but uh, barring them, uh, the, the, impl the implication of the literature has been that, that essentially this was uh, free, um, uh, free labor, free, mi free migration a free labor migration, whereas the, the migrants who uh, uh, you know move from India, uh, if you include the indentured labor, then that much of this is supposed to be unfree labor, right? That's the distinction that is made. But as McEwan points out, there are actually a large number of Indians and a number of other people, Chinese, of course, uh, you know, uh, later on, a number of other ethnic uh, groups as well who are actually going to move in very, very large numbers. And he's talking about really tens of millions of people who are really moving. Uh, now, when we look at when we look at indentured labor, so one of the readings you had was this thing was this book called Coolitude, uh, you know, about 20, 25 pages, uh, and and those pages are extremely evocative of the circumstances under which they left, because as I had pointed out to you very briefly, uh, many of the people who actually left weren't aware of where they were going. Uh, virtually all of them were illiterate. There was a very small percentage that would have actually been literate. Uh, many of them were recruited under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, some of the literature suggests that some of the people, some of the Indian indentured labor who went to places like Trinidad and Fiji were actually uh, kidnapped. Uh, that's, uh, all these are, there, there are long narratives tied up to, to, to all of this. Uh, then we have the passage. Uh, the passage would often take several months. Uh, conditions of the passage were obviously uh, far from being satisfactory. Uh, sexual assault, for example, was not uncommon. Very often by the, by the doctor who was assigned each, each or the surgeon as he was called, uh, each ship was assigned a surgeon. Uh, they had a person called the protector of immigrants. So the protector of immigrants was a person you found both at the port of departure and the port of arrival. The whole idea of having the protector of immigrants was to ensure uh, that people who were leaving uh, were leaving of their own free will, that they, were, they didn't have venereal disease uh, or cholera or typhoid, uh, infectious diseases, uh, so forth and so on. But again, this is all in principle because in, in actuality, we find that the conditions were extremely difficult. And as I said, there's actually a fair bit of literature which suggests that the protector of immigrants was himself a person who would often take advantage of the situation, take sexual advantage of women, for example. There were not very many women who went, uh, but as, as the system continued on over the decades, uh, the British stipulated that a certain percentage of all the immigrants who left would actually have to be women, uh, partially because, of course, uh, in the early decades, uh, which happens very often, in narratives of immigration, the proportion of men to women was overwhelmingly in favor of men. Uh, a, uh, you know, fewer than 10% of uh, Indian indentured labor, uh, and this would be true, by the way, to some extent of free labor as well, uh, but fewer than 10% were, were women in the early years. Uh, and this, of course, would create enormous problems once they arrived and they started working on plantations because once they arrived there, there was a protector of immigrants at the port of arrival as well. Uh, partially because of over the course of three months during the passage, of course, a person's health might change, their condition might have deteriorated. So they were the protector of immigrants at the port of arrival. Uh, and then from the, from the port, they were then dispatched to various plantations where they would work. Uh, working conditions very often meant a 12-hour, 14-hour working day. Um, and where did these people live? Very often exactly in the same places where the slaves had lived. Remember, Indian indentured <coughs> labor is being used to replace people who had worked as slaves after the abolition of slavery and British possessions in the 1830s. All right. Um, now, I'm not going to discuss that 
uh, anymore. Uh, you know, but what I do want to do is I want to bring the narrative up to the present. Why? Because what happens in these societies? So if you take Trinidad, Guyana, if you look at the bottom of the slide, Trinidad and Guyana as illustrations. So Trinidad and Guyana, of course, are in the, are in the Caribbean. And in both these societies, the indigenous population had been largely wiped out. The indigenous population would have been the Caribs, right? The word Caribbean is related to the word Carib, of course, is from the Caribs. Uh, so the indigenous population was largely wiped out. Uh, and I, I want to just underscore the word largely, because there, it's not that it's completely absent, but you're really talking about very few people there. And uh, then you have a Creole population, you have, uh, yeah, that is, uh, the. The, the uh, white population that had actually been born on these islands. But what's going to happen in Trinidad and Guyana over the course of 150 years? Remember that this mi indentured migration begins, we're talking about in the 1830s, 1840s, right? So the course of 150 years, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, the largest group of people are going to be in Trinidad, for example, the Afro-Trinidadians, so these are people who had been brought there as slaves, black people, uh, continued living there even after the abolition of slavery. Uh, and, the, and the other equally large group was Indo-Trinidadians. So if you look at the population of Trinidad today, uh, we're talking about roughly about 40 to 43% Afro-Trinidadian, about the same Indo-Trinidadian, and the remaining 15% would be everyone else including some Chinese indentured laborers, not very many, Creoles, that is local whites, okay? Uh, and then, of course, some people who are mixed, and then a few indigenous people, the Caribs, all right? But essentially, what we're speaking about are what? We're speaking about two ethnic groups, <coughs> neither of which is indigenous to Trinidad. Exactly the same story in Guyana. Exactly the same story in Guyana. And, and, and one of the consequences of importing all this labor was that now there is a kind of a, a, a racial divide in both Trinidad and Guyana between the Afro-Trinidadians and the Indo-Trinidadians, both of whom, in a sense, have been played off against each other, right? Because in, in some sense, both of them, of course, I'm saying are actually foreign, if you want to use that word. I mean, you could say that in the Caribbean, except for the indigenous people, which is the same story in the United States, everyone, quote, was at some point a foreigner. But what is, it, what is the dispute? The dispute is who has priority of arrival? Right? How, do we, how, do we, how do we divide the political pot, as it were? Right, this is the question that comes up in both Guyana and Trinidad, where there is, I'm saying, an a, a, a immense racial divide, and the question of racialism remains the predominant question in both of these societies, in Trinidad and Guyana, because these are the two societies which are capable of mustering, given their numbers, that they both roughly number <coughs> about the same. These are the two groups that are capable of actually mustering political strength. Uh, now, the, in, the, the Indian proportion has been slowly going down because the Indians used to outnumber the Afro Trinidadians because there's been a large migration of Indo Trinidadians to the east coast of the United States. So, if you ever go to New York, uh, you're going to find that there's a very considerable population there. On the other hand, some of the Afro Trinidadians left for Britain, right? So, their numbers diminished in that particular fashion. Uh, but nonetheless, even after all of these migrations, we're saying that this is a fundamental story of both Trinidad and Guyana. Fiji is a little bit different. Uh, I, I just give you the illustration of Fiji here, another place where there was massive Indian indentured migration began later than it did. Okay, it began later than it did in the Caribbean. It started in the 1870s uh, in Fiji. But there you have a racial divide which is not between two ethnic groups who are both of whom came as immigrants, rather the divide is between ethnic Fijians, that is the indigenous population, and the Indo-Fijians. Because what happened in Fiji was that the number of Indians who were brought in was so large, and remember this is all happening under the British. This is all, this is all happening under the British. These are all British colonies, 
Okay, uh, and again, I'm simplifying the story because Fiji is a little bit different because you have a system of native chiefs and all of that. But what's going to happen is that the Indians at one point are going to constitute about 65, 70% of the population. So the indigenous population feels like it's being swamped. The other complication in Fiji is, uh, I was there in 1997. I can tell you what I experienced then, okay? And, and, and this is what the literature corroborates. I found when I was there in 1997 that all the professionals, so when I speak of professionals, I'm talking about engineers, scientists, doctors, <coughs> university professors, lawyers, all of them were Indians. Right? Partially because, of course, there was always a kind of an attachment to the idea of education among the Indian middle class. Right? All the farmers were Indians. So I, so I went around asking, what do the ethnic Fijians do? If they're not, if they're not the farmers, they're not the shopkeepers, Indians are the shopkeepers as well, all the professionals are Indians, what do the ethnic Fijians do? And the answer was very simple. All the government jobs, right? Because, it, because in Fiji, given, given that the indigenous population was, is still there, they essentially were able to monopolize the political system. So unlike in Trinidad and Ghana, where both the, where the Indians were, were strangers, as it were, immigrants, and so were the Africans, in, in Fiji, the, you had an indigenous population which, which said, of course, this is our country, right? So the political system really belongs to us, and this is something that the British encouraged. So one of the consequences of all of this in Fiji was that the Indians basically became disenfranchised. So they were the farmers, but Indians were not allowed ownership of property in Fiji. So you could farm the land, but you couldn't own it. You know, right? And so, so the implication of all of this, again, is racial strife in Fiji, as in Trinidad and Ghana, but for somewhat different reasons. Uh, and eventually, what we're going to find is that the Indians are going to be driven out. So there are going to be three political coups in the last 30 years, and the percentage of Indians went down to 40% from being well over 55, 60% at one point, all right? So that, so I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this story up to the present because I'm simply here trying to suggest to you that when we look at what happened in the 1830s to 1880s, then of course the logical question is, so what are its implications down to the present day? Down to the present day. So if you go to the Caribbean and you try to understand the nature of these societies, what one has to do is to go back to the 1830s to understand how, what were the origins of the system that brought the Indians over to these places, all right? But I want to stress just one more thing before I move to the next, uh, next uh, to the United States and immigration to the United States, and that is that there were a substantial number, I mean, we're talking about millions of Indians who migrated not <laughs> as indentured laborers but rather as traders, as merchants. Uh, Burma is, is a striking, striking illustration of that. I, I think I have a slide here. Uh, uh, this is working, but it's not working the way it should be working. We're gonna have to see what the uh, issue is. Let me see if I can find that slide over here, because uh, that will give you a little uh, illustration of uh, what I mean. Um, you know, uh, Burma is in, so this is the, this is it. Let's see. Ah, okay. System doesn't seem to want to cooperate here. Uh, just give me one second. I'm just trying to see if I can. Uh, okay. All right. So, so, by the way, this is a slide which shows you the ports from which the Indian indentured labor was left. So you can see there uh, on um, uh, the two two major ports from which they left. Uh, this is Calcutta over here and Madras over here, and these big circles here show you the where where is it that the Indians who went as indentured laborers, you know, came from. All right, um, and if you look at the following slide, uh, so this this here is is a, a, an extraordinary illustration. In fact, uh, the the next section we're going to be moving into is what I've called technologies, uh, and this is one of the technologies of state. One of the consequences of that. What this is is every indentured immigrant who came to Fiji, <coughs> Mauritius, Ghana, Trinidad, wherever, 
they were assigned a number. Now, you know, these are like mugshots of criminals. That's what they look like. But these are not criminals. They're laborers. They're laborers. You lose your identity. You just become an anonymous number. Right? And that's, that is, of course, one of, the, one of what I'm calling one of the consequences of the technologies of state, because what they do uh, in, this kind, in, in this kind of instance is to really render the indigenous population or the native population or the indentured population into a mass population. There is no notion of an individual in this. Okay, there's no notion of an individual because the Western theory, of course, was that the idea of the individual is a distinctly Western idea to begin with. Right? But here, it's a system of simply surveillance and a system of, accounted, of, of accounting for people, right? How do you account for people? Uh, and this is uh, an article from the Natal Mercury, uh, 1860. Natal is South Africa, right? So the Union of South Africa didn't exist at that point in time. You had a number of different provinces, and South Africa would only become a union uh, 45 years later. But this is an article published in the Natal Mercury. And what does it say? Thursday, November 22nd, 1860, the Kuni is here. It, it is an article on the first shipload of Indian indentured laborers who came to Natal, again, a British colony, to work on sugar plantations. Uh, this is a immigrant pass from 1862. Uh, and you see here you see, by the way, protector of immigrants, right? The person, remember, I've been talking about the protector of immigrants. So uh, this is a pass that was be issued. Uh, and for Indians to move around, you had to have a pass. Most of them actually were restricted. So if you were, so when you arrived at the port, what happened? You were sent to a plantation where you worked, and you were confined to that plantation, right? So there were restrictions on the mobility of Indian indentured laborers, as there were, of course, restrictions on the mobility of slaves. And, and so, in fact, this is one reason why many people have argued that we should really think of Indian indentured labor as, quote, a new form of slavery, all right? Um, now, this is Burma here. So that's a point that uh, uh, I wanted to simply mention here. So uh, Burma, this is India. You are seeing the, uh, the eastern part of India here. This is all of India here. This is uh, Burma, also known as Myanmar now. Uh, why am I showing you this? Because in a country of this size, <clears throat> at one point, there would be as many as 10 million Indians. As, as many as 10 million Indians. Uh, Rangoon over here. Uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, whom we're going to read much later on, went to Burma in 1916. And he said, if I walk down the streets of Rangoon, I see Bengalis, I see Marathis, I see Gujaratis, I see Punjabis. These are all different Indian groups. I don't see any Burmese. This is in Burma. And the economy was entirely controlled by Indians. And they are called Chetiars. They come from uh, South India. You don't see that on the map here. We'd have to look at a map of India here. They come from South India. Uh, you know, so but these are people who are not who have not gone as indentured laborers. That's what, that's the only reason I bring them into the picture because I'm just simply trying to suggest that when we're trying to understand the 19th century here, when we're really speaking about moving into the early 20th century, we're speaking about various different strands of migration, right? And because this is one of the fundamental stories of the 19th century is the movement of merchants, movement of labor, uh, and and all of these provide an illustration. There are other types of migrants too. In the case of Indians, there are soldiers, over one million soldiers who fight. Uh, but you know, whether one should, we, should, we cannot really move, view them as migrants in the ordinary sense of the term, obviously, but they are people who are on the move, all right? Now, let me come to the United States, all right? Uh, the, 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 this, the segment that, uh, as I said, I'm uh, next interested in because, of course, one of the things that fundamentally defines <coughs> Uh, we have a problem here. This uh, this keeps on acting up, unfortunately. Okay. So if you look at this slide over here, uh, uh, immigration and settlement into the U.S. I, in, in my comments to you in my previous lecture, uh, I had uh, you know mentioned to you that of course the, the United States should be viewed as a eminently immigrant society, right? Uh, and uh, 
what we're going to find, of course, if you look at the sources of immigration here, 39% uh, from 1820 to 1860, and 31% from Germany. What might strike you about these numbers? What is anomalous about it? Just very quickly, does anything strike you about the percentages over here? Yes. Most of them were not from Sorry? Is it the Britain? Sorry. Only 16% of immigrants are from Britain. Okay. So that's changed. Which, which, and at one point the number would have been overwhelmingly English, right? The early. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Well, well, that's true. That's true. But that's because the other was, in fact, insignificant comparatively at that point in time. So I, I agree with you. But I mean, you know, breaking down the other into Chinese, Japanese, whatever. We could do that, but what 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 is really striking? What is striking is 39% from Ireland. Why? Because Ireland is a very small country. Right? I mean, what we are talking about is the population of Ireland is being decimated. That is what is enormously interesting. You know, because if you if you compare 39%. Ireland and 31% Germany, you say, well, you're not roughly the same. Yeah, but Germany's population is much larger than Ireland's by a factor of five or 10, right? So what's happening here? The reason why you have enormous immigration from Ireland is the Irish are being subjugated by the English. And what do you have in Ireland? You have one famine after another. Of course, we're going to have to ask, if we were doing a course on English colonialism only, well, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, I've mentioned to you that, that famines are not just simply natural phenomena, you know? That if you look at what was happening in Ireland in the 1840s, you know, we know that if you study the Great Potato Famine, as it's called, that one of the things we know from the research that has been done and the primary documents that have been accumulated around the Great Potato Famine is that the English knew exactly what was happening. And they did not interfere. Because one of the reasons they didn't interfere, the same problem is going to occur in India when you have famines in the 1880s. They didn't occur, the English did not interfere when these famines took place for two reasons. Number one, they had the theory that the free market will, inter, will, will resolve this question. If we have a problem, why, why is there a problem of famine? Because it means that there are some people who don't have enough to eat, who don't have enough to eat. Now the question is, don't they have enough to eat because you simply don't have enough food supplies? Or is it, as Amartya Sen, an Indian economist who won the Nobel Prize largely for his work on famines, demonstrated that famines occur because people don't have access to food. Not because there isn't enough food, you just don't have access to it. Right? And you may not have access for a large number of reasons that some people may have hoarded and this state doesn't do enough. The English view was, well, you know, we believe in the free market economy. If there's a problem, the free market will resolve it. Adam Smith's invisible hand, as it were. Right? That is one reason why you have this famine. The other was, and I think it needs to be said very bluntly, as the English view that the Irish were actually inferior. So if they're dying like flies, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing. Which is exactly the English view in India in the 1880s, 1890s. I mean, you know, if, if the number of famine casualties, which I'm mentioning it right now because, again, these are the sort of things that well, we won't really be able to address on any other occasion. We're talking about 25 to 30 million people who are going to be killed in India in the 1880s to 1890s on account of famines. There's a wonderful book by Mike Davis called Late Victorian Holocausts. Late Victorian Holocausts, where he has a detailed discussion of this. All right? But this is this is this is why I show you this because, as I said, it's it's absolutely extraordinary that yes. If you're looking at it from the point of view of the receiving country, you say that the composition 
as was pointed out here, that the composition of the immigrants has changed. At one point, it would have been would have been largely English, and then you would have had the German and the Dutch present. So if you go to the Midwest, you see a lot of German, Scandinavian as well. But what is significant is that 39% that we're talking about from Ireland, right? That is what is significant because, of course, it suggests what some of the problems were uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Ireland, which led to this massive immigration. And here again, this is you, you can just review that very briefly here, but you can see that there's a considerable increase again from the 18, uh, 1820s uh, up to uh, all the way to 1850. So this is by the way, 1846 is the 47, 48 is a great potato famine, and you can see the numbers really skyrocketing uh, at this point in time. All right. Uh, and then uh, main sources of European immigration, 1841 to 1860. Uh, uh, once again, simply reinforcing something that we've seen before over here. You can see the numbers over here, 914,000 from Ireland, uh, 951,000, you know, roughly from, from Germany. And of course, you have still have a significant percentage coming from the rest of the British Isles. Uh, uh, at this point, you don't see any, you don't really see any Asian migration. But if you look at 1861 to 1890, uh, some of you might rec recall the treaty that was signed in 1868, which made it possible for Chinese laborers to be brought to the United States, the Burlington Treaty, right? Uh, so this is where you see the numbers over here now. Uh, and again, a decline uh, in, in the period 1881 to 1890 because of Asiatic exclusion laws, right? Asiatic exclusion laws, that once the number of Chinese and subsequently, a few years later, Japanese. Um, and then, in beginning in the 1890s, the first Indians coming to the United States, what they're going to have is Asiatic exclusion laws. And, and by the Immigration Act of 1924, uh, something I just want to mention at this juncture, since we are on the subject of immigration, by the Immigration Act of 1964, all Asians were barred from the United States for 21 years, okay? And then between 1945 and between 1945 and 1965, I'll get you in a second, 1965 is the next immigration act. Between 1945 and 65, you're going to, they're going to allow about 100 people from each of these countries per year, right? So, I mean, basically, they're still part of that. It's only 1965 that the immigration act is going to bring in a new system which is a national origins quota system, and the quota for each country is going to be set at 20,000. And that is effectively the system you have in the US today. Okay. Do you have a, do you have a question? Why does it say USSR? Why does it say USSR? Uh, because they're simply using an anachronistic category. Whoever, whoever made up the chart is using an anachronistic category, because of course, uh, what they really mean here is Russia, Right, the USSR didn't exist at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, but the, what they really mean is, is is Russia and all the neighboring, you know, republics or portions, which eventually made up what became the. But the USSR, of course, as you know, at this point doesn't exist. But I, I didn't make up this chart. I I, I simply took it from uh, the person who made it up is obviously not thinking of the anachronism involved here. So now before we move uh, last year. To, illustration I want to look at very briefly uh, is Brazil. But before I do that, I just want to make a few observations about um, immigration to the United States. Uh, because obviously, the story I'm giving you here is a demographic story. Uh, what is much more interesting uh, is, of course, various kinds of cultural elements to that story. And so the reading that you had right, were those, were those letters from uh, immigrants uh, because one of the things that you always have to ask is how does immigration really take place? And one of, the one of the ways in which it takes place in the 19th century was that people would write letters back home. These letters were widely circulated. Uh, and you know, very often people, people sort of think that, well, you know, the literacy levels were relatively low, but that doesn't matter. Because a letter, when it was received from someone who had just arrived in the US, uh, and had, you know, in America and had lived there for one month, they write a letter back to their relative, relative in Czechoslovakia 
or Germany or wherever they emigrated from, and then they describe a land of, to use a proverbial expression, a land of milk and honey, and all of that. That letter that the person is writing to his mother or to his sister or brother is going to be read widely. A letter is not what we think it is today, a private communication. It is very much a public document. So when you read these letters, I want you to bear that in mind too. Because the letter that would have been received, you can be sure that the mother who receives it or the father who receives it is then going to, you know, when they've opened it, they read it themselves, then they're going to summon all the neighbors and they're going to read it as well, right? These practices of reading have also changed historically over a period of 150 years, 200 years. Right? We think of reading as a solitary act. Right? Uh, the most romantic image of reading is you know, you go and sit by the banks of a river or you sit by your window and you, know, you read a book. Right? Uh, but reading was not always that. It was very often a public act as well. So, but that's a, a very different subject because then, you know, practices of reading and writing and all of that, it's a, that has to do with the intellectual history of books and practice of reading and all of that. Uh, but, I, but I simply say, simply mention it to you because uh, I'm saying that, look, we can do a demographic study of immigration, which is what I very briefly offered you is, okay, how did really, how did the United States come to be the US? Look at all the waves of migrants who are coming. But then, of course, each of these groups has its own kind of cultural history. And, and the McEwen article, which is otherwise a very dull article, one fundamental argument there is an important argument. I want to reinforce it. I've mentioned it before. Namely, that the literature, until very recently, has thought of the people coming to the United States as people who were basically coming of their own free will. These are free migrants. Then the supposition is that, well, you know, the Indians and the Chinese are going as indentured laborers. Uh, but as he points out, that this is not an entirely accurate story because there was a massive outflow of Indians and Chinese of people who were not indentured laborers as well. All right. Now, and finally, since uh, we're, we're interested uh, in a, a global understanding of this, we take a third illustration, and that is, of course, the case of Brazil over here. Uh, because as a percentage of its population, immigrants in Brazil uh, are also uh, uh, account for a, a hugely significant percentage of the population of the country. Uh, and what is striking here, of course, is that other than uh, people coming from uh, Europe, from what you might describe as Western Europe uh, and the Mediterranean, you also have a significant number of Japanese, right? If you look from 1880, to 1969. Uh, in fact, the largest Japanese population in the world uh, outside Japan, people of Japanese ancestry, is in Brazil. Is in Brazil, all right? And people coming from what here is called uh, the Middle East. In 1880, this category wouldn't have existed. It's the same problem with having USSR listed. No, nobody called uh, that part of the world the Middle East. Uh, this is a post-World War II American uh, category that we're really talking about. Uh, and if you look over here, so this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, gives you an idea of the division of uh, Brazil. Um, this green portion, this very large portion over here, is comprised largely of people of American Indian, okay, or Amer Indian origin, Amer Indian origin. Uh, this part of the country, by the way, all of this here, the, in, 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 the, in the purple uh, and the green, this is sparsely populated, very sparsely populated. The vast bulk of the population of Brazil is right around here, uh, roughly with, within 200, 250 kilometers of the coastline, okay? Uh, and, and so this portion is Amer Indian. This portion here is comprised of people who are largely black, largely, not entirely, particularly, for example, Bahia over here. And then if you look at this portion over here in the red, Sao Paulo, and all of that, this, this uh, part of the country is uh, predominantly white, okay? Or more white, let's say, than other portions of 
the, the country, all right? Uh, and in Brazil, uh, uh, if we had the luxury, this is a little bit, so this is 2006, if you look at 2011 figures, uh, they're a little, bit, a little bit different, the Asian or indigenous population is closer to 1.7. The population of Brazil, by the way, is 200 million plus. Uh, I want to remind you of that. I mean, so Brazil is one of the most heavily populated countries in the world, uh, all right? Uh, so you might, because you might think to yourself, well, 1%, well, but that's one, one or two to 2% percent, uh, of 200 million is not an insignificant number, you know, obviously, right? Uh, and mixed. So what is most significant here is the, is a large <coughs> number of people who are mixed. And, and in Brazil, by the way, uh, in Portuguese, uh, uh, and uh, particularly with respect to Brazil, uh, how much white blood you have, uh, whether you have one half, one fourth, one eighth, one tenth, one twelfth, one fourteenth, one sixteenth, so there's a separate word for each of these proportions, a separate <coughs> word. So there's a there's a it, there's an extraordinary kind of hierarchy uh, that one would have to think about, uh, and this is just a indication of the main ethnic groups that you have in Brazil. Uh, this is this is a very rough and broad way of categorizing it, because then, as I said, uh, you know, when you when you when you look at the category of mulatto, for example, you can break it down uh, depending on what percentage is black, what percentage is. Okay, white, right? And for each of these, there would be a separate word. So there's, there's been a huge body of scholarly work uh, which has tried to understand uh, why is it that uh, uh, racial categories came about in this particular fashion in, in, in uh, Brazil, all right? Uh, but uh, once we move away from the demography, uh, uh, beginning with the fact that you have about 10.7 million Africans who are brought to Brazil as slaves, the largest number anywhere, more so than who were brought to North America. I just want to point that out because typically, once you know, if you're living over here, you've been raised in this country, you might think that well, the institution of slavery was particular to the American South, but but of course, it's not particular only to the American uh, South. So Brazil has been characterized by immigration, centuries of immigration from all over the world, certainly from Europe and from Africa. And what you're really talking about is a systematic settlement of European uh, groups, uh, invaders initially, the Portuguese, followed by the Spaniards, uh, the Dutch, the English, and the French, um, all of which began over 300 years ago, working largely on sugarcane plantations, largely working on sugarcane uh, plantations, and as in the American South and, el and elsewhere where you had <coughs> slavery, what this really meant was the enslavement, uh, displacement, and uh, eventually extermination uh, of, uh, or annihilation of uh, a great number of people who were indigenous, that is, you know, Indians, all right, in that part of the world, right? Um, as I said, you know, it's possible to sort of offer a much more elaborate account we would what, then have to look at interracial relations, but that's not really, we're not doing a sociological study of how interracial relations have panned out in Brazil over the course of the last 150 years. What, what, I, I, think what I did very briefly with Trinidad and Guyana uh, gives you a little bit illustration of some of the factors that are at play, all right? All right, so we're done basically with this whole question of migration. I want to start, uh, take about five minutes uh, to get started on technologies of the state. So the segment that you have for this Wednesday, we're about one and a half lectures behind at this point in time. Uh, the, the segment that you had, uh, you had two readings. One is the social history of the machine gun, uh, about 20 pages from there and about 15, 20 pages from a book by a German social historian by the name of Schivelbusch on lighting, right? Uh, when did street lighting come in? What were its consequences and implications? Well, those are some kinds of technology, of course. But I want to begin very briefly with technologies of the state. In the 19th century, the state is going to become increasingly empowered. 
And when I speak of technologies of the state, I mean technologies in two ways. Okay. So this is complementing the ordinary sense of technology. So when we think of the machine gun, or when we think of uh, aircraft used for bombing the country, we're speaking about a certain kind of technology, a certain kind of military technology in this case. We can think of railways as a technology. We can think of lighting as a technology. But I want you to also think of technology in the second sense. And that is instrumentalities of governance. How does a state become <laughs> such an overwhelming force in public life? Right? So those. To think of that, we have to think of technologies of the state. For example, take as an illustration the census. Right? So here's a question. Let's see if we can get a few quick answers so we can start thinking about it. What is a census? It should be a demographic survey. <clears throat> demographic survey? Yeah. Okay. Is it? Is it? Uh, Something neutral, or uh, can we think of how? If I, if, if, if the question were to you, let me let me just uh, uh, reframe the question. In what way is the census perhaps a political instrument? Yes. survey might tell you something about how you frame the very idea of the nation, right? What you might ask in the census, for example, right? Okay, but can we can we add to that anything? Yes? It sort of forces you to put yourself in a uh, place in society, your income, and where you are. Okay. Uh, so uh, typically, if you look at a census of any country, uh, if you had, uh, one of the questions they would ask you is your gender, right? How many choices do you think that a census offered you? Um, until very, very recently, I mean, I, I, and even now until very recently, it's only in a couple of countries that you might get. What, what would be the choices that you would have? Sure. Male and female, right? Male and female. So what if you belong to a group of people? Now, I know that nowadays there's a lot of discussion about transgender people and the whole LGBT and this and that. Uh, but you know, for example, uh, in uh, many countries, uh, India is uh, again a very good illustration. I wrote a very long article uh, in a journal called Social Text about 20 years ago on a group of people known as the Hijras. So the word Hijra is very often translated as eunuch, which I don't think is really what we're really speaking about. There is an anthropologist um, who has written a book on the Hijras where she calls them the third gender. Okay. Um, so, so, and, and we know that this group of people have been around for centuries, right? Uh, they're estimated to number of around 500,000, roughly. Uh, we're just talking about a group, group of people known <laughs> by a certain designation, in this case, the Hedras. Uh They may be people of ambiguous genitals. They may be transvestites. Uh, they say that they are neither male nor female. They're neither non-male nor non-female. Right? So if you, you can go through the whole Aristotelian system of logic and figure out, well, what are they? Are they male? Are they female? Neither male nor female. Neither non-male, neither non-female. Both. Right? So on and so on. Now, what does the census do? Right? I want to conclude with this remark on the census so that you can start thinking about the technologies of the state. I want to suggest to you that we have all grown up with the idea that the census, like many such things, is something that captures the reality. For example, if I took a census of, this, of the, this classroom at the present moment, I am capturing the reality. So many of you are male, so many of you are female. So many of you are white, in some sense or the other, so many of you are non-white, right? So forth and so on. Right? That's what we have grown up with. I want to suggest to you, I want you to start thinking of it that way, that the census does not just capture the reality out there. It actually creates it. It creates the reality. 
None of these technologies is simply an instrument which simply captures an objective reality. Okay? It actually shapes that objective reality. All right? So we're going to begin. We're going to resume our discussion from this. And